So finally, it's time to explain viscoelasticity. Okay, so mechanical properties of biological tissue, polymers, and uh, other uh, mater materials inside the body depend uh, on time. So the, the rate at which you try to apply the force is also a factor, uh, not just the stress that you applied or the strain that uh, it forms. And so we can see here, typically, in this case, the faster as you start applying the force from, let's say, 0 to whatever you want, let's say 10 newtons of force, or like 200 megapascal, as you apply that, the rate at the faster you you make that happen, the faster you move from zero to two hundred. That's, in a sense, um, creating an internal a, a much greater internal resistance in the muscle. So, if I was to pu pull a muscle really really fast, I would have this kind of trend. Not necessarily muscle, but like any viscoelastic property. I'm just going to relate it to muscles because the topic here is on muscles. If I were to, let's say, pull a muscle really fast, what's going to happen is it's going to apply, a, there'll be a lot of stress in it to resist that tension. But if I were to slowly let it deform, just slowly go away, uh, slowly increase the Newton, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot more softer, a lot more malleable for me to move it up to this position. And as we can see here, the fracture point also changes. So if I do something very fast, I have to be cautious because after it only needs a, less, a small amount of strain for it to start fracturing. Whereas if I do it at a very uh, slow speed, I can strain it a lot more before it will actually decide to give in. Okay. So we can see over here, uh, viscoelastic. Visco refers to materials where stress is pr proportional to strain rate. So we have over here uh, the viscous part. And what does viscous mean? As I said over here, the stress is proportional to the rate of change. It's this formula over here if you want a mathematical model, but let me just explain that again so you can get what, what really that means. Okay, if you were to apply a very high force on it, this thing's gonna resist it. The material is not gonna allow, it's not gonna let that force occur. Why? Because it will produce a high internal force. But when you apply that force at a slow rate when you slowly increase it to that high force that you want the material is not going to apply that high force because you, the rate at which you're doing it is very slow so as you can see here the stress is only determined upon the rate that you do it and this, it has it has this dash pot symbol when you try to sorry it wasn't sorry i think i didn't show it another time this is a formula anyways stress is equal to mu uh, strain rate and it has this dash pot symbol, which basically, you can think about it as like this being like a, a closed cylinder, and this is a piston, and uh, they have some kind of fluid in here. And if you, were to, if you were to push on it, it would slowly deform and slowly give to the shape it is. But the rate at which you do it will always matter. Okay, uh, so then what's the elastic part of viscoelastic? Well, that refers to uh, materials where stress is proportional to strain. Stress is proportional to strain. That is Hooke's Law, we, we've seen before. Uh, Hooke's Law in terms of springs. Uh, we can see stress is equal to some uh, Young's modulus in this case, and strain. And Young's modulus occurs when the st stress-strain graph uh, has a linear straight line, a linear proportional straight line. Okay, uh, let me go back to this point which I skipped. And this basically explains this point over here. Okay, so here is called the uh, elastic loading. So in this case, which occurs in elastic loading, when I apply a, a stress a strain on it, it's gonna produce internal stress at along this uh, path. After I reach the maximum strain, and then I let go, it will say this is not elastic. This is a little curve and I let go, it's not going to reapply the same stress I applied to it. It's going to apply less than I applied to it, which means there's an energy loss. And that energy loss is usually referred to, uh, is, is usually uh, because of uh, the molecular changing and absorbing and heating. If you were to 
constantly pull a rubber strap, a rubber band, you would notice that it would uh, actually get a little warm. And so this ph phenomenon is known as the the hysteris uh, loop, stress strain loop. And if you find the area within here, if you can find the area within here, that is going to be the mechanical energy loss. Because the area under a stress strain curve is the energy absorbed. The energy absorbed per unit volume. Okay, so now we're going to go into the relationship. How do we combine an elastic uh, phenomenon in a material with with a viscous uh, pro property, and how and then how do we get about a viscoelastic? How do we explain it mathematically? We're going to say Maxwell is going to say here, this uh, a visco viscoelastic material may have this property. It may have a property that is elastic, but also viscous at the same time. It's both of them in series. And the equation, when you derive it mathematically, you're going to get the coefficient of uh, the co coefficient here, mu, uh, divided, uh, times the strain, uh, stress rate, the change of uh, stress with respect to time, plus the modulus over stress is equal to modulus of elasticity times stress is equal to modulus of elasticity times the coefficient over here times the strain rate. Okay. Kelvin now came up with his own uh, a different form that you can relate a visco viscoelastic. This is another form, another uh, scenario for a viscoelastic material, where the it is elastic but also but also viscous at the same time in in, in a parallel fashion, and that relationship will simply be the addition of the two, elastic and viscous at the same time. If you look at here the elongation with respect to time, this strain with respect to time, you're going to get this formula out. You can derive this formula by uh, keeping a uh, solving, by setting the stress as a constant. So you, you can say over here, you know, let me assume, uh, let me assume the stress is going to be a uh, constant, which means then the derivative of this would be zero. The derivative of a constant is zero. And then I can say, well, it's one. Let's, let me assume that stress is just one Pascal or one uh, Newton per meter squared, whatever. Then I'm gonna left. I'm gonna be left with uh, modulus, modulus of elasticity that can be canceled out. And then you can solve. You, you can see here. You can solve for strain, uh, stress, and the strain rate. And then you can integrate it. So you're gonna have one over u is equal to the strain rate. And if you integrate that, you get t, and you have one over e because of the. Okay. Mm. Okay, back to Kelvin. Uh, by the way, these two are the same thing. I call this strain and I call this creep. They're both the same thing because creep is strain which depends only on time. So this strain which depends on time is creep, which, which depends on time. If you solve for Kelvin, you get the same thing as this one. I just put the values of uh, tau over here. Uh, this uh, because of, there's no space over there. Uh, but uh, the formula just like. As long as you know the formula, there's not much I can explain. I'm not going to do a mathematical proof of how you divide the formula. Uh, the third model is the standard linear solid. And I assume this is the, the most common one because this explains most materials, especially the biological ones, very accurately. So this, it combined of, it's combined of Maxwell and Kelvin. Maxwell and Kelvin together. This is a formula you get. Again, I'm not going to explain from now on because it's just mathematical. Same thing you get over here. This is a creep, and this is a stress with respect to time. You have a stress with respect to time. Let me go into the, the real physical part, the mathematical part over here, using visual representation. So we have creep over here, and then uh, relaxation. So let's see over here. We have Maxwell over here. What happens? When we have, uh, okay, before I do that, let me just explain quickly. Creep is, again, time-dependent deformation, which means stress constant. So we want to see what happens to strain. Relaxation. What does that mean? Strain is constant, but stress is changing. So you have to remember those two. And that's how I will explain all these 
graphs and the different uh, results that happen. So let me start with the relaxation for all of them. We're saying relaxation, stress, a strain is constant. We're saying strain is constant and the material will internally relax. It will internally just um, produce less stress. Just give in to the form that you left it at. So we have a constant. So let's say at this point, I gonna, I'm going to apply a stress, just a constant stress, and I'll leave the stress constant. Well, what's going to happen? Let's look at the model over here. If I apply a stress, this spring will deform to the stress that it needs to be at. So I'll apply a string over here, and then it's going to reach a peak. So the, the, the spring will just say, absorb all the energy instantly. The, the spring will take the energy. But what happens when I keep it at that stress, when I keep it at that stress? This dash part over here, because it's time dependent, is going to now slowly give in to the stress that is already being applied. So because I'm holding the stress, sorry, I'm holding the strain constant. Because, I, let me just draw it here. So it more sense. If I have a material over here, and then I, I strain it over to this much. Initially, if the dash part was over here, the, the spring will stretch all the way here. But, because this dash part will have some give to it, now that I'm keeping it at this length, not long to stretch, this dash part will say, okay, you know what, there's a force being applied by the string on this side and the, the strain that the, the strain at this side, allowing it so that it doesn't return back to normal position. So this dash part will say, you know what, I'm going to just turn now into a big oval, let it slowly spring out, and the spring will say, okay, take all the energy. This viscous material will deform and stay at that position. Now in this, in this situation, no energy is in the spring. The viscous material changed its shape. It's in a sense a permanent deformation, quote unquote. But it's not really permanent because it's a viscous material. A viscous will change anytime. So it just relax. And there, it's not going to apply any force because the shape just changed. The material just accepted the shape. Kind of like like a, like a Play-Doh. You, you put it into shape, it's going to stay there. And then you can apply another force. That will go outside. But what if it was parallel? Well, if, if it was parallel and I suddenly applied a strain, notice that this spikes, this spikes to infinity. This goes all the way to infinity. Because it's not possible to make a viscous material suddenly change its shape. It's not possible. What, to, to meet a pure viscous material, will apply whatever force it has so that it's not going to change the shape instantly. So this is not possible. But what would happen is, let's say, if realistically it happened, let's say, in 0 0.1 millisecond, this spike would happen like so high and then it'll come back down. And the reason is because we're applying a force such that that viscous material cannot apply anymore. And so the material will just reach its maximum. And once the material, the viscous material says, you know what, I can't apply any more force, then uh, it's going to stay in that shape. But that viscous material is going to be held by the spring. So this viscous material is no more going to be applying any load. What's going to happen from then on? The spring will be applying extra load, and that spring, because I'm straining it at a certain length, that spring will always st be storing that energy and trying to return it back to normal. And in the last case, you can see here, similar scenario, except that now, for Maxwell, the first spring can absorb all the energy so that a spike doesn't happen, and then slowly the second, in, the second spring will join in. So you see the smooth rise and then smooth fade to a normal level. Qu quickly, let's do the creep. If now we're trying to keep the stress uh, strain constant, we're going to keep the, uh, sorry, we're keeping the stress constant. So if we were to keep the stress constant, then what's going to happen? As soon as we apply force, everything will go into the spring. But because we're keeping a stress constant, this material will slowly, slowly deform. It will slowly change shape. As long as I'm increasing, the, um, as long as I'm keeping stress, this material will slowly change shape. And it will keep on going on. It will keep on changing shape until it's it, it, it's like physically impossible for it to change anymore. Once that once that situation occurs, then another uh, phenom phenomenon will, will happen. But the point is, we're going to turn it off at a certain point and say, okay, now we're going to leave you as it is. We're not applying any stress. Well, what's going to happen? Once the stress stops, 
the spring will release all its energy, but not the viscous material because it's already straining that much. So what's going to happen? It's slowly going to, it's just going to remain in that strain. It's going to be strained this much. That viscous material is like that Play-Doh. You stretch it, and then until until you don't apply the force, but if you don't, once you don't apply the force, it will just stay there. The elastic material will just drop in right away. Quickly to the Kelvin, what's going to happen now? We're applying a parallel, uh, a constant force. Because we're applying constant force, this viscous material will slowly give in. It will slowly give in. And in the meantime, the elastic material will absorb some of the energy. And then when it dies out, once you stop the stress, the elastic material will just drop it down. It's, if you can do a small drop here. And then the plastic, uh, the... Sorry, sorry. Let me say that. I got confused with the SLS. So what's going to happen is after you reach the maximum, you drop out the the stress and the elastic material now, the elastic material will pull the viscous material back because the elastic material has all the energy and it wants to have zero energy. To have zero energy, it has to return to its normal position. So all the energy that's in the elastic material will be used to force the viscous material to comply to it. It will be for used to force the viscous material back to where it was. So a force was used to deform it and the spring will say, you know what, I'll return you back with this force that I have absorbed. And so for SLS, you can explain the same thing. Stri uh, sorry, spring absorbs it. The same material as Kelvin occurs. And then that first spring will just drop it instantly. And then the other part will just be Kelvin again. Slowly re return it back to normal.